see you out there, Geza. If you can hear me, good morning, everyone. Salam, Tisfai. Great to see you guys here. Oh, Abo, that. Um, that um that profile picture almost swept me off my feet thought we were being hacked or something i hope you guys are having a lovely morning and thank you very much for joining uh, today i um i'll be more like facilitating this session for this morning uh with the help of our our lovely tutors so uh without further ado I'd like to request if there's any sort of announcement from the team. Any announcements from the team? All right, so I'm assuming there are none. Okay. Okay, none from your side. All right. Okay, so we'll go straight into uh, getting to hear a little bit from you guys quick enough. Uh, then, you know, um, any updates, how, how was your weekend and all that, just to hear a little bit about how your weekend was, how was your rest time, and uh, what are you um, geared up for. So it would be nice to see some hands up seeing we're having some really good numbers today, early enough. Okay, Martin, you want to go first? <coughs> yeah, good morning, uh, Mary. Bonjour, good morning. Yeah, bonjour. Um, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, I had a great uh, weekend. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, there was many things that I had gotten to do, actually. Uh, for me, I started my weekend on Friday uh, because I was traveling. Uh, there's a friend of mine who was actually, there's a sort of like an engagement party. He was wedding, so uh, I had to go in and stand because I was helping him out. Uh, so, yeah, that is, that's what I was doing uh, during the weekend. Uh, but last week, I think, the project was good. Uh, we were, I was able to complete, do the assignment and also do the deliverables. And I got to learn about causal inferencing, something that was new to me. I also got to learn about um, just how to connect uh, the causal inferences with the, with the with modeling or machine learning. Yeah, so that's uh, that machine learning project was really good, and it it gives somebody experience on the causal inferencing and also on just the modeling part. So this week, uh, today I'll just go through the task. I see uh, how I'm able. I'll plan it out and just see how much I'm able to go into it uh, in the first run. Then I see uh, how it will be able to go on. Yeah, thank you. That's all from my side. You're muted. Okay, thank you so much, Martin. Um, uh, thanks for the update. Um, today we are going to uh, have a segment of presentation, and I would like to call upon I, if Desmond can hear me, uh, you could just unmute and let us know how it will flow and how that segment will go forward. So, Desmond, over to you if you can hear me. Um, so good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, loud and clear. Um, so thank you. So uh, I think we would go with um, uh, uh, those who would love to present, and then uh, we'll give you like uh, uh, seven minutes to do your presentation of um, how you are able to do your uh, week's challenge. And then from there, I think, uh, uh, those who maybe did not get um, one or two things from um, how you were able to uh, do your last week's challenge, they can be able to ask questions. So um, maybe we will have uh, volunteers. 
All right, guys. So volunteers and those who want to present how they did their challenges so that they can get feedback, general feedback. This is your ch time chance to shine. So don't uh, don't lose it and also get some feedback. So this uh, would be the nice time to see some hands up or volunteers. All right, so we can start off with Biniam, then uh, then then Martin, because I can see they're the ones with their hands up. Yeah, and until I can I set up my machine, uh, maybe Martin should go first. I'm actually just starting up my machine, so. Okay, Martin, is your machine laptop open that you're happy to get started, or should we? Um, get a feel from just a, just a second. Uh, let me open. Okay. So as uh, as we are waiting for Martin to open, um, uh, this will be a session that will be led by Desmond. You'll be able to pick it up. Maybe we can hear from one more person about um, uh, what they're up to, what they're geared for, how was the rest weekend. One more person before Martin takes the floor. Or perhaps let's hear from there's somebody we've not heard from for um, a long while. Samarit, if you can hear me, do you want to unmute and tell us how your weekend was? Samarit, if you can hear me. Oh, your mic is not working. All right. Oh, Faith. Faith, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you, Mary. Um, last week was great. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, last week was great. Um, I managed to complete uh, all the tasks um, and I was uh, quite happy about my, uh, my work. And uh, it was also a, a great uh, long weekend. Um, I'm very much happy about that in Rwanda we have uh, two consecutive public holidays so that's <laughs> that's a good thing for me and um, yeah I am looking forward to uh, learn more about uh, data engineering uh, this week uh, the first project um, uh, about data engineering was uh, I didn't do well so I'm excited for uh, week nine thank you and you are muted Oh, <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. And and for those who are wondering what the public holidays are, on Friday, we had a happy Independence Day, a happy Independence Day here in Rwanda. And and, and today it's a holiday. It's a Liberation Day. So they're very big public holidays here in Rwanda. Anyway, so uh, Martin, are you are you now ready to take it on? Yeah, I think. Uh, okay, over to you me. and Desmond to run the show. All right, I'm assuming that everybody can be able to see my screen. Yes, perfect. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> basically what uh, we were supposed to do was you we were supposed to analyze uh, the data and then you we were supposed to make casual uh, graphs from it and also to make uh, to do machine learning, you combine the machine learning with the causal inferences, inferences that we had combined, uh, we had gotten from that particular, uh, uh, the causal inferences. So uh, first of all, I was just going through the data and I realized that uh, there was something that uh, was unique. The, the, I was looking at the unique data. So the first thing that I was looking for in the data was uh, the info, the shape, the uniqueness, the missing values, the duplicates, and just a just a, a short a snapshot. So I, I realized that with the data, uh, this was how most like all the data apart from the diagnosis and the ID were floats. That was uh, they were integers with decimal points, and then uh, there was the other thing was the shape was 
uh, 569 rows. That is, we had 569 records uh, on that particular data set uh, with 33 columns. But unfortunately, uh, and then also when I was looking at the uniqueness of the data, so I realized that the only one that had unique data, because if this is 569 uh, and these other ones are different numbers, and that means the only one that had unique data was the ID and the others didn't have unique data, meaning that you could group them and do all those types of things if you uh, really wanted to. The, 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 the other thing was that there was no missing values in the data. Uh, apart from those, this particular column, which was the name column, and I think this comes because the person, maybe the, the way the data was packaged and, and given to us, just uh, had forgotten to re-index. So you just re, uh, maybe uh, after indexing that should go out. So uh, once I was able to just have a quick uh, snapshot of how the data is, I was able to uh, handle the missing values, which as I said, it was only one column. I removed that one and then uh, after that I split the data to get my X and my Y. Uh, that is the X uh, is the independent, the X is the independent variables and the Y is the dependent variable. So uh, I was able to split it and this was uh, what I was able to get uh, once I was, I was, <coughs> once you run the, just a, a, a quick descriptive statistics like for example getting the mean the median the the the, the, the mean the standard deviation the the minimum maximum the 25 percent uh, the quartiles 50 percent to know where the data lies uh yeah so after analyzing uh all that i was able to come to the conclusion oh, so i that was for the independent variables for the dependent variables i just used a simple count plot so that you can be able to understand so there what i realized is that uh, there was the area mean, the, the, the area mean was perimeter was perimeter mean, area SE, there is a very high variation. Uh, probably maybe right now after opening it up, the colors have gone out and uh, I have to run it again so that it can be able to show, but I won't do that because of time. Uh, so then the next thing was visualizing the variability and that was, uh, you can be able to see that all these, they, they, they all look different apart from uh, variables such as uh, we can see this and this they look the same and also this they look the same so one two three uh, look the same if you look at also this one two uh, three they look the same then if you look at uh, one two they look the same so there was something uh, you could actually be able to infer from that and uh, that's what I was trying to make the inference where I was saying that uh, uh, there are some certain variables when you look at the f features it looks like they, are so, they, they look uh, very similar and that means we can be able to classify the variables uh, you can be able to classify the variables so uh, you can visualize the variability for the first 15 columns then the next 15 columns and this was how it was looking so in, in the next 15 columns you could actually notice that uh, this and this are more or less similar and then you can also notice that uh, this one and this one are similar and also you could notice that uh, in terms of structure this one and this one are similar but there is some bit of difference and then uh, this the first one and the third one the first one and the, and the second one and the third one have the same structure uh, and so you could be able to notice that uh, there was some bit of similarity and also that what you can infer from that is that there is some bit of classification you can be able to do so the next other way was using a uh, another the visualization spread so this can be able to let you know if you want to cluster data like for example this one i can cluster the data uh, into two uh, that is the this the this the mal, 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 malign uh, virus uh, i mean malign cancer sorry and then there's the benign cancer so you can be able to just look this this variable you cannot be able to cluster it into the malign and benign because it's mixed up this one you can, the first one, the third one, you can be able to uh, easily uh, classify the two. Uh, this one you can be able to classify. Uh, the, the fourth one, no. The third one, uh, to some extent. This one, yes, yes. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, no, yes, yes, and no. So you can be able to just uh, single out the particular variables which you want to classify, which will help you in classifying into either malign or benign 
uh, type of cancer. So uh, once uh, that was able to be done, uh, the next thing was doing bivariate analysis. And when I was doing bivariate analysis, I was using uh, like the concave concavity was concavity point was and you could see there was some correlation uh, between the two uh, also this correlation between uh, the concavity mean and con concave points mean and also between concavity SE and con concave points SE so I just took that uh, con the, the concavity and uh, explored it to the max so that I could be able to see uh, how uh, the, the, the how, how the correlation actually works though if you look at um this particular this particular the last one the, the data is clustered towards uh, over here down that means that uh, that also can help us to understand that it can we can be able to do uh, more classification on that particular uh, on that particular data so then the next thing was classifying uh, based on now all the variables so i did a pair plot which can be able to show you whether things are correlated how uh, they are how whether we can be able to classify them the we can also be able to see whether there is normality to some extent like uh, we all know how a normal is just a bell-shaped curve like for example you can see normality uh, in some certain in some certain uh, variables and then there is some that are not normal so you'll just have to uh, make them to be uh, uh, normal when, when when you're doing the normalization and the standardization so that was uh for the clustering i mean for the pair plots then after that i just did a correlation map just to check uh the how the variables which are very correlated so with this you can be able to see the ones which are likely colored are um are highly correlated and the ones which are not heavily colored are not that much correlated so we could actually see that uh for these ones they are not correlated the, the ones which are dark but the light ones like for example this one we said one 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 all this th this one which said one zero point nine uh, we i used the uh, 0 0.9 as the threshold and i moved out the ones which had more than uh, 0 0.9 and this is uh, how it looks now uh, so that you can be able to uh, make inferences so that was on the on the on the on the eda on the sorry on the on the featureization i i had to do some bit of feature extraction so that i could be able to know uh what features will go into the causal graph so with featureization i used uh eight techniques that was uh using correlation technique there's a chi-square technique there's a random feature recursive feature elimination technique there's a rfecv technique lscv technique extra trees, uh, trees technique there's the vote based feature selection technique and also there's the pca technique which you're going to just uh, check out so when using the first uh, technique uh, which is the feature selection and correlation uh, these ones I think I had, I had mentioned uh, over here that I just uh, took the ones which were uh, 0 0.9 plus 0 0.9 anything that had a correlation of 0 0.9 plus that one was I was adding that to the list so you come up with such a list and you realize that actually it's true that they are the all these are the ones which are uh, above 0 0.9 that is one and then uh when you when you try to do a uh, prediction you can you can realize that it's it improves slightly uh, after trying to do the prediction so <clears throat> we go to the chi squared method this one it it just uh, allowed me to be able to understand which features um I'm able to I'm able to select based on uh, selecting the k best based on the chi square distribution, and it was I was able to come up with. Uh, let me let me open this. Uh, in the chi square, I was able to come up with this. This uh, if you count them, they're around I think uh, twelve if I'm not wrong. Uh, so the next one was RFE RFE. After that, uh, I came up with. 10 variables which were were selected as to be the best variables uh, when i went to rfecv uh, 15 were the ones which came but this doesn't really make sense because uh you want to reduce you are trying to do a uh, reduction so if you get if you get 15 and 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 um if you get 15 it it really makes it doesn't really help so uh, the other one was uh, the random forest, just the normal random forest, and this one it can be able to show you the way the the features are arranged based on uh, their probabilities. So you can be able to check them out over here. Then for the LSCV, I was able to get three 
uh, which are very important. Then by trees, I was also able to get uh, three again, which are very important. Then uh, when I com what I did is uh, just combining, uh, so that you can you can combine all the methods that we've used, uh, all the methods, and then you vote. The ones which had a vote of more than two are the ones which uh, I took to be the best variables to deal with. So I collected this into a variable called FS score, and I now uh, I'm now moving on to the casual influencing. So when you get this, you are able to uh, get features based on the correlation, chi-square, RFE, RFE, CV, RF, extra T, L1, voted and, and all that. So when you vote, you combine all these things that are above. And so these are the ones which I was using uh, for these particular causal inferences. So I used the ones that I was able to get from the feature, featureization, and then, uh, so that was that. Then uh, you load the data, after loading the data, you get your, you get, you just remove any missing values and all that. So this is how the data looks like. And then I started by doing my first network. Uh, the first network, it, it looks like this, but if you look at it, it doesn't make so much sense. So you can just use the, the zero point you can you can use the ones that uh, zero point five as the threshold for the networks with the best uh, past fifty past the fifty percent best networks. So uh, when you when you knock off fifty percent, you will end up with such a graph. And then uh, we continue to just doing the same thing, but now using pi graph v's. And then we added that concept of jacquard similarity index so that you can be able to calculate the uh, jacquard similarity uh, between the different graphs. So the first graph, uh, I just did uh, below uh, the threshold of 0 0.8. And this was how the graph appeared. Uh, diagnosis, having the most connections. And then now I started now scaling down the data. So I started with 60% of the data and this was how the graph looked like. And this was the jacquard similarity index between the first one and the second one. It was, it was 0 0.667. And then with 70% of the data, this was how it looked like. And the jacquard similarity was 0.917. I was really surprised with how the jacquard similarity index just shot up like that. Uh, and I couldn't really be able to understand. But what I I, I, I said is that it's because maybe uh, we are comparing the this uh, SM two edges with SM edges which had all the data. So 80% uh, of the data, this was how it was. It went reducing, it went reducing. And I think this could be out of two reasons because maybe of how I was normalizing the data or it could also be of um, the, the, the edges were affected by the, the first, uh, the first, the first, the first, the first uh, graph. So when you go to 100% of the data, this was how it looked like uh, with a jacket similarity of 63.6. So I realized that my best graph uh, for me was uh, this one that had um, uh, 91, 0.917. But essentially what you want to do is like, if I make any changes to the graph, if I, if I remove data, it, uh, removing data is just one way or doing other things, you can just do any other thing, but it should still remain with a high similarity with the previous data. That way you can be able to make the same inferences as uh, you'll be able to make uh, solid inferences. So the next thing was uh, to uh, get the edges that were based on diagnosis. So this were a uh, one, uh, the smoothness mean, the concavity mean and the smoothness was, these were the ones which were coming as outstanding for the, for the, for the, for the features that were linked up with the diagnosis. So I discretized uh, the data that is making it into discrete. So when you discrete, when you discretize those three columns, it comes smoothness mean, concavity mean, smoothness first, and of course, uh, your diagnosis. So that, that data, there's a way that those variables appear to be uh, discretized. And now you can now model uh, your casual network uh, based on the Bayesian estimator. So when you model based on that, you can be able to you can be able to uh, check out uh, the the variables how they you can you can be able to see like according to concavity mean smoothness mean smoothness first and diagnosis uh, how they are affected uh, in any in any changes whenever we we are trying to do any predictions how it will be affected so 
when I tried to do some predictions, the prediction was this 0, 0.0 and then one and then uh, 0 0.01. So there are some that it was getting wrong, some it was getting right. And my conclusion was that my 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 model was 71% accurate. And I think the reason why, yes, you can get a lower uh, a lower one than the 96 and 95%, it's because uh, with with casual inferencing, you're not looking to, uh, your first aim is not getting it to be 100%, but rather what your first aim is, is you just want to get your model up and running and ensure that it can be able to answer more questions as compared to just uh, any other model. So any other model will just, will be able to answer you a few a few questions. It can score 96%, but it will only answer a few questions. But this one can score 71%, and can answer more questions as compared to that. And so, uh, yeah, of course, this is subject to improvement. It can go higher up to even, uh, it can go higher as you do parameter tuning, which I was looking at from the ML flow and the DVC and all that. And then, um, so when I was just drawing some bit of trees, I was just trying to look at how the data was, the, the, the way they are connected with the parent node so that I could be able to make uh, any inferences that I, wanted to make as a uh, for the conclusion so finally i just drew the final graph which shows how the data is connected to be able to give you um it, it, this this gives you a very clear perspective on the best graph that is one because i use the best graph i drew the best graph and then i this one it gives you a dot graph this dot graph you can use it with other uh libraries like for example the do i Excuse me, I I don't know whether I'm able to be heard. I think I think you can you can you can conclude. Um, okay. Can conclude. Uh, yeah. So that that this one can be able to be uh, integrated with the Duai library and also other libraries uh, that are just for cause cause of networking. I wanted to also share the application that I created, but I think maybe that is for another time. So uh, that's it uh, from my end. Uh, and uh, thank you for being uh, attentive and thank you for, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Uh, I saw Geza Hen's hand was up. I, I don't know if you, Geza Hen had a question. Oh, Hinok, you have a question? Yeah, yeah uh, I do. Uh, thank you, Martin. That was an awesome work. I, I have uh, one question. While I was trying to come up with my causal graph from the data, I kept getting lines that were pointing away from the target variable, from the diagnosis node. So, uh, like, what kind of normalization did you use, uh, use on your data? For me, I used the min-max. I also had the same issue, by the way. Uh, it was because of the normalization. Again, I, I was using uh, the standard scalar. Is that the one you're using? Uh, when I used that, uh, the like the direction of the lines changed, but I I don't understand why that was happening. Uh, I was hoping maybe you could uh, point me to a resource or just explain it to you. Oh, why normalization me, had that kind of effect? Of, for me, um, I, I also realized that when you do different types of normalization, it has uh, different uh, effects on the, on, on the graphs, because for me, I use the minimax scalar and the standard scalar has a different uh, effect uh, the reason which I think uh, I, it's subject to correction is because when you look at the data, the data that uh, we are trying to predict uh, is zero one. It's a categorical variable of zero one. And this other data that is being normalized, if you use the standard scalar, it goes all the way to the negatives. And when it goes to the negatives and you're, when you're looking for the ones which are, are, are highly which can be connected, it it gets like biased towards the ones which have data that is more or less similar to that particular type. Like it has some bit of negative, some bit of positives. So that's what I I thought about. But uh, it can be uh, anybody else can add on that. Uh, sorry, just to just to see if I understood your point correctly. So when we use the standard scalar, it, uh, it changed the target column into some negative value that 
represents the, the zero entries and some positive value. I think it was ne the negative 0 0.73 something for the zero uh, entries and 1.3 something for the one value. So you're saying that since most of the data in the in the in the table we have as positive data, the diagnosis com uh, column points towards them. Or uh, what I was saying is that um, these uh, yes, the target variable changes from diagnosis to another target uh, variable because it looks at the one that has data that is uh, clustering around that particular. Uh, that particular the range mean max the, the maximum and the minimum so that is what you could be able to clearly see uh, from the way it was behaving because when you use the mean max scalar it puts everything in between zero and one and when it puts everything in between zero and one there's a way that um you when when you compare it with the target variable which is zero one it can be able to maintain it as the target variable but this other one, it, it gets values to negatives. So when you get negative values, it changes the target variable to be the one. It chooses a different target variable uh, in the graphs, the way I had, I had, I had seen. OK, um, OK, I think. Thank you so much, Martin, for uh, your presentation. I think we have uh, one more. Uh, that must be Biniam. Biniam, I think if you are ready, you can uh, have your presentation within uh, okay. can you hear me? seven minutes. We can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Biniam. Okay, uh, Martin, that was, that was a great uh, presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, so I don't have much to add to what uh, Martin, Martin presented, but I'll just try to go through my project quickly. Can you see my screen? I'm, I'm not able to see your screen. Wait. Uh, okay, it's up now. Okay, I think we can see it now. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. So, uh, okay. Yeah, you already know the objective. The uh, last week's objective was to uh, try and create a causal graph out of uh, observational data and uh, uh, merge it with uh, machine learning. So basically, uh, naturally, we start from the EDA, which is explorative data, data analysis. So at this stage, what I did was the uh, usual uh, common steps. So first, I looked at the raw data frame. Then, uh, like uh, Martin said, I also looked at the shapes and the information the from the info you can see that almost uh, all of them except a couple of uh, uh, variables are plot type uh, and uh, it seems to be that there is no null values in all of them except for the last one which is unnamed 32 which is something that usually comes when the uh, when the data is loaded into uh, memory so and uh, we'll be removing that last column before moving on. So from this, we observe that there are 569 rows in such three columns. The last column is already uh, completely empty. Because, uh, I already told you that there is no null values in the all variables are flow, flow type except a uh, couple of variables. So during the cleaning, <coughs> I checked for outliers. I made uh, a custom function that uh, I trade through <coughs> the data in the checks for outliers. Uh, <coughs> when I was running it earlier, it was not uh, working for some reason. Uh, I didn't have time to check it, but uh, 
uh, this function was supposed to uh, give you a data frame with all the variables on <clears throat> on one side and their outlier uh, uh, information on the left. Uh, then after that, I just uh, run another uh, an <coughs> ED function that is a built-in function describe, which showed me some of the mean uh, standard deviation, uh, <coughs> the median in other quartile informations. Uh, from this, we can see that some have a very high mean and some have very low, which is a problem when it comes to the analysis that comes later. So we will need to standardize uh, these values and uh, normalize them so that we can make, uh, so that it will not skew our results later on. Uh, we can see that the diagnosis of target variable have this kind of distribution. Most of them have a benign uh, type of uh, cancer and uh, other around, I think, 45% are uh, <coughs> malignant. So, yeah, uh, I mean, 37%, I'm sorry, 37% are malignant and 63% are benign. When we come to the distribution, you can see I used uh, a pair uh, a violin plot to see some of the distributions. Uh, it's actually a combination of the normal box plot and the uh, uh, distribution plots. And from this graph, we can see that some some of the graphs are more symmetrical than others. It shows us that the, those that are more symmetrical uh, are, cannot be used for uh, classification later on, but that's because uh, the one thing I didn't tell you here is uh, the color codes are telling you that the green ones are uh, uh, malignant uh, types in the uh, the orange half is a benign type. So that's what I meant by uh, symmetry. And those, those that are asymmetrical can be used for classification like uh, the concavity worst, um, also the concave points worst, and radius worst. This can be used for classification later on. Uh, that means they can be used to actually predict the diagnosis. And those that are symmetrical, like the fractal dimension worst, uh, and uh, like the perimeter uh, standard. Uh, SER somewhat difficult to be used uh, for classification later on. So I also run other classifications and uh, uh, graphs. I also plotted other graphs to see the distribution. You can see that the diagonal line is just showing uh, us the distribution of the variables, and the other graphs are just showing us a, a scatter plot for each of the graphs. Some graphs, as you can see, are well correlated, while the others are uh, uh, somewhat mixed, so they cannot be used for uh, classifying. Classif the red one, by the way, are the red uh, dots are just uh, the malignant uh, uh, types in the, I mean, the red ones are the benign types in the, the blue ones are the malignant. Uh, and so some of the graphs can be used to clearly classify this part, these uh, uh, two types of uh, cancer diagnosis, and the others cannot be. Uh, basically, this uh, chart is uh, obvious, so I'll, I'll just move on to the next stage, which is checking the correlation between the different variables. From this, you can see that some are uh, highly correlated and some are not correlated at all. Uh, since uh, on the next stage, we'll be using this information to uh, filter out some of highly correlated features because they will not add extra information to the general uh, data set. So we can just choose one of the highly correlated uh, features and uh, move on to the next stage. Yeah, so uh, then finally, the saving uh, part will be uh, run. I couldn't uh, spin up my uh, MySQL database for some reason, so uh, I'll just show you the code, which is basically uh, we will be adding the SQL dataset to 
uh, SQL schema something like this uh, with uh, information something like this. Uh, so uh, here uh, basically we'll be using the SQL Alchemy uh, package and uh, we'll be passing some of the informations. I created a database called week eight and I passed in the user and password information. And then I'll be using the to SQL method of the data frame to turn my cleaned <coughs> that, that data frame uh, into an SQL uh, uh, instruction and we'll be uh, using that to add the data frame information into the SQL database. So next we'll be talking about feature extraction. Uh, on the modeling notebook, we'll start by loading in the clean data frame. Uh, and then uh, we'll, I'm checking out whether uh, all the data sets are loaded or not here. It seems to be uh, loaded. So moving on to the next, here we are first uh, taking out the target variable into its own uh, separate uh, variable and uh, storage, that means the target series in the feature data frame will be holding the, all the features. Here I'm checking out if all the features are present. Then also I'm checking the target data frame. Yeah, it seems to have uh, all the values within it. So as I told you, we'll be using the, uh, I used a couple of feature extraction methods here. One is just using the highly correlated uh, a correlation matrix as a, a basis to eliminate some of the variables. That means I, I will be removing some of the highly correlated variables from here. Uh, since uh, it's tiresome to do it manually, I created uh, uh, a, that, uh, a method that removes correlated uh, features. That means those are that, that are correlated beyond the 0 0.9 coefficient will be removed using the remove correlated uh, function. This uh, function can be found in the scripts uh, the, in my project. Moving on, uh, here you can, you can see that uh, number of correlated, uh, highly correlated features that are found are 10. So in the, the, these features are this, perimeter SE, concave points mean, perimeter worst, and so on. Uh, this has been removed from the data sets and uh, this would be our final data set. After removing 10, we'll be left with 22. So we still need to further filter the data sets and uh, to do that, I'm, I'm going to be using uh, uh, a filtering technique called uh, ERF, uh, REF, that means recursive uh, in the feature elimination method, which will be uh, shown later, but before uh, I use that method, I created a simple uh, forest test that checks uh, the accuracy level of the current data sets. And later on, after removing the uh, features, we'll also run this test again to make sure we haven't lost much accuracy. So this uh, test basically just uses uh, forest random forest classifier to check uh, uh, the accuracy of the existing features in predicting the target variable. Uh, which is currently 0.95%. So after running the select feature with the RFE method, uh, we will be getting, we, uh, we are telling it that we need, we want only 10 features in the end after the filtration. We can specify the final number of uh, features we want. So I'm specifying uh, 10 here. Uh, so finally, I got these 10 features. Uh, and I checked their uh, accuracy using the forest test again. Uh, you can see that it has not lost any information at all from the data, uh, from the uh, eliminated features. So scaling and normalization followed after that. I also created a custom uh, method that scales and normalize the data. Once uh, the data scaled and normalized, I, I moved on to the causal graph discovery section, which is uh, where uh, we'll be using the data set to predict uh, possible uh, graphs for uh, uh, our data set. Uh, so before we create the data set, um, I've classified the data into different fractions. Uh, 
of course, the 100% being the entire data sets. I've also created a 20, 40, 60, and 80 uh, percent uh, of the data sets. So you can see that the size of these data sets are described here uh, from 113 to 569. And the last one being the entire data set. Uh, and then I created the ground truth first. That means using the entire data sets, I uh, <clears throat> used uh, the causal links from Pandas uh, method to generate a ground truth uh, structural model. And then for the rest of the data sets, I also run the from Pandas method in the past the corresponding uh, fractions of data sets and uh, created the structural models. Next, I checked their stability using uh, the Jacquard similarity index. I just, here what I'm doing is I'm comparing the ground. Uh, first, uh, I plotted the ground uh, truth, which uh, looks something like this. I'm using uh, 0 0.8 uh, as uh, a threshold for uh, showing uh, the data. As you can see here, uh, the target variable uh, is uh, shown around uh, to the left, I'm not sure if it's visible to, to you guys, but basically the four uh, nodes that are connected directly to the target are the smoothness worst, compactness worst, uh, smoothness meaning compactness SE. So we'll be checking if this graph is stable throughout the other data sets. So uh, I also plotted the one with 20% of the data sets and uh, I checked their uh, the, it's a uh, similarity index with the uh, ground truth. And the result I got is around 74%, which is good, uh, considering that I'm only using the 20% of the data set. So uh, when we look at the target variable. I'm sorry, Binyam, uh, please, please try and conclude because of time. OK, OK, uh, OK. So basically, after uh, uh, running the Jakar similarity index across the different <clears throat> structural models, I'm getting consistently a uh, high number, which is beyond 70%. So it seems to be working just fine, preparing the data in graphs. Uh, after that, uh, a modeling, I used the, the two kinds of modeling, that's the Bayesian network modeling. Uh, and uh, another modeling, I used it, the logistic regression model. After creating these models, I checked uh, their accuracy and other metrics using the test in the uh, training data, um, the test data. Uh, I ran these uh, tests for both the original data sets as well as the filtered one, and I seem to have gotten a pretty high uh, result. Let me just show you the logistic regression accuracy results. When I use the entire data set, uh, features to predict the data, I'm getting around 92% accuracy. But when I use uh, filtered uh, ones only, that means um, uh, the ones that are in the Markov blanket, I'm getting around 77% accuracy of prediction, which is high. So uh, it seems to have been, it seems, it seems to be working. So the, yeah, uh, I think, uh, there is not enough time to go through the rest of the course. So yeah, uh, thank you. I'll be stopping here. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Biniam and um, uh, Martin for your presentations. And uh, I hope all of us were able to learn something from uh, the presentations that uh, uh, were given. So um, I think I think because of time, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Mary is still on the call um, so that I can uh, hand over to her for uh, maybe the hot seat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Desmond. Thank you, uh, Biniam and Michael, for uh, for the presentations. They were awesome. So, I, um, yeah, we are going to dive straight into um, our hot seat today. And um, and as you know, our player for today, our crowned player is no other than Daisy. So Daisy, if you can hear me, uh, just uh, turn your camera on and get set. And everybody else, 
the drill is as usual. I, we can start preparing questions and I should be seeing, there you go. Hi, Daisy. Yeah, I should start be Hi. seeing, um, uh, yeah, some hands up, some hands up. Some hands up. We'll not start until we see like some 10 hands up because it's, you know, it's rapid fire. We all know how this goes. And um, yeah, and Yebabo, you're welcome. Thank you. It's, it's good to have you back. We've missed you all week. And probably Thanks, you're going, Mary. yeah, if you're going to stay longer, you're going to close for us. We would like to hear a little bit from you and what you've been up to the previous week uh, after, the, after the hot seat. So guys, I'm waiting for your hands up. Come on, guys. Nobody is curious about asking Daisy Salam. There you go. You're always, you're always prepared for this. Any more, any more hands up? Okay, I can see Meron. Now, still waiting. Dagmawi, well done. Still waiting for five more at least. Five more at least so that we can go. Henok, there you go. More hands, guys. It's almost time. We only have seven minutes. Okay, Baruch there. Okay, Melaku, you're there. Okay, I, I think we have enough hands. And you can keep them coming, guys. Okay, Ooh. so Daisy, you know the drill. If you're not comfortable with any question, you can always pass. I have my pen and paper to tally how many you're able to respond to. And then we'll get started once you feel ready to go. Are you ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. Oh, you've been ready since the beginning of this. Okay, I'll just time you really quick. I just uh, start the. All right, and we are going to start in three, two, one. Salam, go. Okay, uh, Daisy, what do you do on the weekends after you join Tin Academy? What do you do on your spare time? Um, I either go shop for grocery or I just stay in, clean my house, and sleep. Awesome. Okay, Maron, go. What's something that makes you the happiest when you do it? Um, I'd say maybe giving back, just helping someone. Awesome. Okay, Dagmar, we go. Okay, Daisy, who's on your playlist? <laughs> um, Banner Boy, for the most part. Um, we said mostly Afrobeat. <laughs> Awesome. So Daisy, if um, what are the three topics that you can talk about for the whole day if you were to chat with somebody? Um, one, I'd talk about imposter syndrome. Um, two, um, being very self-aware and being yourself. Um, three, I'd talk about um, something fun, like going to the market. <laughs> okay. okay. You know, are you ready? Go. Uh, how you got introduced to where you got introduced to the word of programming? Um, I did an undergraduate in computer science, so that's how I got introduced to programming. All right, Biruk, go. We can't hear you, Biruk. All right, as we wait for you to fix your mic, Melaku, you can go next. Okay, can you tell us uh, three things about you? Three things that makes you unique. That we don't know, or oh, three things. Um, okay, three things you may not know about me. One, I really love mangoes. Um, two, I believe we are in a simulation, um, and uh, the person who's controlling it is having so much fun, but then like, I also really believe in God, so controversial. Um, three, one thing you may also not know about me is that I'm a last one of five. Um, three, three boys to girls. Perfect. And we'll say, test fire, do you want to go? Guys, anything okay. you have more to answer? Okay, Daisy, uh, what's the nicest thing and the uh, meanest thing you did to a person? <laughs> um, nicest thing I may have done to someone is probably just help them out when they are, um, stuck. Um, I really can't quantify that. Um, about the meanest thing, I'm not so sure. I'm not like a very mean person. I try not to be mean. 
Ok, ok. Faith? Hi, Daisy. Uh, how do you start your day? Interesting. Um, depends. Depends on the day. Um, Ten Academy has really changed that living for me. But usually when I wake up, I um, draw my curtains, I work out, as I make breakfast, um, hit the shower, um, and then um, start my day if I have meetings or if I'm leaving the house, I leave the house at that time. But since Ten Academy, I don't really have much of a morning routine. All right, Meron, I can see your hand up. Go. Still have two minutes. Meron, are you there? Okay. Yes, yes. What's something people like about you? One thing. Sorry? What's that What's... one thing people like about you? Oh, um, my energy and my smile and I guess my vibe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting. Amal, do you want to go? How do you like celebrating your birthday? Um, I like to travel, so if I can get away from home, maybe go to the coast, I'd do it. Awesome. Tadese, go, go, go. We can't hear you, Tadese. Hello, hello, Daisy. Good morning. <clears throat> what type of, uh, which type of car you need to buy? <laughs> Your dream um, car. I must say this. <laughs> I must say this. Not sure of the version yet. I'm not a car head like that, but I know it has to be a German machine. Mm. So, Daisy, who's the person that you admire most in life and why? Um, I really admire my mom a lot, just because, simply because of her story. She, she, she came from nothingness and she was able to just do something with her life. Um, from having a diploma, or from having a diploma degree to finally just doing her PhD, really makes me very proud of her, and I look up to her in so many ways. Time up. Well done. Well done, Daisy. That was uh, really cool. Uh, maybe you can tell us. Um, so you've been able to respond to uh, one, two, three, 17 questions. Uh, perfect with zero, uh, with zero pass. So <laughs> tell us quickly, um, how was your experience as we close? Um, I think the experience was really nice and strange at the same time. It's strange because I think we're not so used to like turning on our cameras at the academy. So it feels really weird because <laughs> yeah, you're like on the spotlight. Um, um, and then someone can really see the expressions on your face. So like I could tell you are not very convinced by some of my answers. Um, so I'm just like, okay, so <laughs> I need to restructure and re-strategize for the next question. Um, but okay. then again, it was quite fun. I liked it. All right. We also enjoyed hearing a lot from you. You could see like you couldn't wait to turn the cameras off. But thank you so much. It was lovely, guys. Thank you so much. And you can give a big hand clap to um, on the chat to Daisy. So we are coming to a close. So I would like to invite Yebabel to say hi to us and probably use a minute or two to kind of just tell us what he was up to and you know anything he has in mind. Yebabel? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, thanks Mary. And well, you know, happy to see everyone again. Last week, it was the first time probably in a while that I left my computer uh, and went away without it. And it was, it was fun. So I, I went to Thailand and basically just did a holiday, so nothing more. And I didn't think oh. about any work, so that was good. Mm, yeah, so I, you know, Thailand is, I think, after COVID is different. I think every place after COVID is somehow different. Um, but what is really impressive is that it seems like sales and marketing there is in a, you know, genetical, doesn't seem like that people learn about it. It's just like in their dream, probably they sell something. I don't know. It's like, so, but in a good way, like, I mean, it actually it's not uh, other places like they, they kind of try to force you or you might not like it, but this one, you actually enjoy it. Um, because it's basically, they tell you what is available 
and then mm -hmm. you decide. And so basically you don't need information is highly matured. So probably they are using some kind of um, scrum. I mean, it's like saturated communication. I would say like you will always know what is going on, uh, whether you read it or not, somebody will tell you. So that, that's really fascinating. And a lot of application can come out of that. So, and then it's a commission based country, in my opinion. So that's really means, uh, you know, and also one really fact about Thailand is that the lowest unemployment in the world. So there's no, it's below 1%. That basically means like everybody does something like, so I think that's a really a good model uh, to look into. I mean, I, I don't know how it's going to be um, copied in Africa, but I think that's yeah. in terms of unemployment, you know, Africa has the biggest and Thailand is the, the lowest in the world. So there's something and I learned a lot um, from the culture and food is food. You know, if you know Thai food, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. that's it. Awesome. So the crap, I think that's the best I can do when it comes to Thai language. But thanks mm. for the updates. And I hope we'll get more insights about uh, what you learned from there or what you could share with us throughout the week. So guys, we have a spillover of three minutes, but it's been a lovely, I would say it's been a lovely stand up today. And one thing I'm impressed about, we've had uh, attendance of above 30 from the seventh minute up to now. So it's something to be really proud of. And thank you very much. So let's see each other. And remember one quick announcement, uh, today's um, CBS, it's at 11, not 12, at 11 because at 12 we have uh we have another presentation uh that uh, some of our colleagues uh will be presenting to algoran and so we'll communicate more in in a few well a few minutes from now we should share some information about that so let's meet again here at 11 bye guys